Okay, so we, I think we find ourselves, I'm sure you'll agree with me, in a period of time uh, where there is a shift in the tectonic plate, if you like, of history. We've had them before. From a European perspective, they've happened quite often. They happen, uh, they happen at a 30 or 40 year interval. Um, we had, uh, during the First World War, uh, the Russian Revolution, we had the Depression. After that, we had um, another war, and the Iron Curtain came down in the 1980s, the end of the 1980s, the Iron Curtain went back up again. And now we find ourselves in another of those periods in history, uh, which is very disturbing, uh, and of course, a great deal of pain and anguish. But can we do something? Uh, can, will we, as, as uh, Europeans, as members of the world, indeed, emerge from this stronger and better? Remains to be seen. Uh, and I want to talk about globalization. Uh, why? Because I think as an individual is interested in sustainable communities, uh, I'm keen to debunk some of the scapegoats, if you like, of uh, our current, uh, uh, the, the current political dichotomy. One of which I think is globalization. Uh, another is the role of uh, organizations and of cooperation. And I want to see uh, what might be a better method of uh, you know, disrupting the status quo and building it again so that it is better. Um, so let me go into a little bit of detail. First, about globalization. So globalization occurred in two waves in modern times. The first wave was from 1820 uh, through to about 1914, driven by, by technology, by fast uh, travel around the world. Uh, and the second wave occurred around about this time. So this is the 19, end of the 1950s, where air travel uh, made um, the exchange of goods and services very, very quick indeed. So this particular song came out in 1958. And if you listen to the words, we get a, a bit of a musical interlude, uh, you'll see, you'll get a sense of the optimism of the time. So take it away, Frank. It's a 30 second clip. Remember a couple of countries there were mentioned. Uh, India was mentioned and Peru was mentioned. So if you, if you uh, chart the success or otherwise of globalization, India is, a, is a, one of those countries that's benefited enormously. Uh, GDP per capita is up. Uh, there's a, a, an emerging middle class in India. China is another country. But there are losers. Uh, there are losers in this uh, um, phenomenon. Uh, countries like um, countries in uh, some countries in Africa and some in South America, uh, where poverty has not uh, has not improved uh, particularly. Um, so you've got uh, if you take Peru as an example, because Peru was mentioned in the song. Um, by 1971, so you rolled on a few years from uh, when Frank Sinatra was singing his song. Uh, in the UK, almost everybody that's 91 percent of uh, households had a television set. Whereas in a country like Peru, which is mid-table, you know, in terms of uh, GDP per capita, uh, only one in five had. So by this time already, particularly in this second wave of globalization, which uh, brought with it not just the exchange of goods and services, but the exchange of ideas, and people could see how poor they were, there came an awareness uh, that there was inequality in the world. And the Peruvians found a voice to this guy. This is uh, Gustavo Gutierrez. Uh, and he said that the poor are a byproduct of the system in which we live and for which we are responsible. He didn't say for which you are responsible. Uh, uh, he was writing this in the Practical Theology of Liberation in 1971. Uh, his point being there is a systematic failure uh, to um, to spread wealth evenly around the world and that uh, inequality is systematized. 
If you take another perspective on globalization, globalization is not about dumping ideas on other people. Um, uh, this general, gentleman is sorry, Roland Robertson, and he was right, he's a sociologist, and he wrote in 1992 that, uh, that uh, globalization is um, particularized as well as, is a particularizing as well as univer universalizing phenomenon. So you could take something like rock and roll, you can, you can broadcast it to Japan, and what you get back is something completely different. Um, he, even to the level of you know, cultivating rice in a paddy field. So that might be a new technology for one culture or other, but you know, the next door paddy field might be cultivated in a completely different way. So we shouldn't be uh, considering globalization as a, um, yeah, as, 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 a, as a wave, if you like, of a foreign culture invading another culture. That was his point. These cultural icons are popular right around the world. Yes, they, uh, they might be emanating from a single point. Uh, actually, it's the second time Beyonce appeared today. Um, and also Schwarzenegger. Uh, but they're popular, uh, they're, they're loved, uh, and they're, they're utilized, and they're also um, uh, integrated into cultures um, in a way that's not negative at all. Our very own, our very own uh, uh, cultural hero. Um, I hope this is an image of, of, uh, of how our um, esteem you know, our, as, as Britons uh, is, going to, is, going to, is going to be perceived worldwide in, in the coming years. Um, so what are we going to do uh, to improve our lot? Um, this is Nick Stern. He was called Nick Stern when, when I was at university. Anyway, now he's Lord Nicholas Stern. Um, however, he took, he took he, uh, one of the positive aspects of globalization, which is that we can make decisions about climate change. Um, and he asked people to be, um, you know, in, if, in the policy community, uh, you know, deliberate and to provide clear direction for new development, investment, and inclusive growth. He said that the, uh, development banks were absolutely critical. Um, are there enough of those development bank resources around, not just to cope with climate change, but to uh, implement policy in other directions as well? Uh, this is Nobel laureate and economist uh, Joseph Stieglitz. Um, what he had to say, uh, particularly in the context of uh, neoliberalism, which is, again, something not to be confused with globalization. Neoliberalism is about uh, you know, opening up trade, making decisions about... Uh, uh, you know, tariffs and barriers and that kind of thing. Um, what he was saying that uh, the problem that we're facing is that economic globalization uh, has outpaced political globalization. And according to Stieglitz, we need more, we need to act more cooperatively. We don't have overarching decision making. So rolling back on cooperative structures is not something that Stieglitz would advocate. This is Nigel Cameron. We've had a, a lecture already today about um, uh, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence. Uh, what Cameron is saying is that uh, we, we, we've got to embrace technology. Um, he's a futurist. He's got a Washington think, think tank. And he talks about um, technological unemployment that is coming down the road at us. This is something that we're going to embrace because it's going to be good. We're going to take however many casualties there are in the road, on the roads uh, today, and we're going to reduce it to next to nothing. It's a good thing. There are already um, tractors in the course of production that can take the labor out of farm work because they can fully autonomous. You may have seen them advertised, uh, you know, showcased on the TV recently. But again, just like Stieglitz, just like Stern, it's the policymakers that have got the take, that, that have to take the lead in coping with technological unemployment. Uh, Cameron says uh, that we've got, to establish, we've got to consider technology as just offering us tools. We have to establish the frameworks within which those, those tools are used. Who is going to do this wonderful work um, of establishing those frameworks and exploiting those tools? There's the public sector and there's the private sector. There's a, a top-down policy-led policy agenda and there's the empowerment of you know, brave people doing things from the bottom up. So if we take the, the first example of how the public sector can, um, can disrupt 
Uh, I think this is, in, 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 uh, in a recent memory, one of the best examples. So along came um, John Major in the um, late, late uh, 1990s. Had a look at our performance in Atlanta in uh, 1996, where we got just one gold medal, and decided to completely change the, uh, the nature of British sport. Uh, it was enabled through, um, through two things, really, one of which was um, funding through the National Lottery, and the other was uh, uh, a selection process in which only a limited number of sports were, uh, were funded, but funded at a very high level, at a level that enabled us to jump from you know, just one gold medal in, in 96 to um, you know, recently we came second in, in the world with 27 uh, gold medals. It's a transformational change that was achieved from the top down. But what about bottom-up changes? Who are, the, who, are the, who are the rainmakers that are going to change our lives? And there are lessons from history about how, if we're not careful, we put obstacles in the way of people. And we need to remove those obstacles. This is Marie Curie. An obstacle she faced was, um, she, yes, as a, as a woman, she faced discrimination. Um, there was, uh, in the case of um, the second person there, which is Tommy Sopwith, uh, the obstacle he felt was a backlash from the establishment against his success as an aircraft manufacturer. He was actually put out of business at the end of World War I by a government that was jealous of the money that he made, and they taxed it all back from him, and it actually made him bankrupt. So he had to reinvent himself um, under, the, under the Hawker label later on. And the third example, uh, this, this geeky guy is almost unrecognizable. That's Richard Branson. But what happened to Richard Branson in the 1990s, after he started Virgin Atlantic, was that the then establishment, which was British Airways, they, didn't, they were jealous of his success, they were unable to compete, uh, and they attempted to put him out of business by stealing um, passenger lists, approaching those people and trying to, uh, and trying to get them from it. And they were, they were fined and duly, uh, uh, duly reprimanded by the courts. But these people faced opposition from the establishment, uh, which shouldn't have been there. Another feature, if you like, of uh, successful um, bottom-up um, transformational disruptive change is that people can um, they shouldn't be pigeonholed into just one uh, one approach uh, this is Octavia Hill who as well as being a social reformer uh, she had other interests as well so she was the co-founder of the National Trust uh, and she also brought about she, she almost invented really social work so she was a polymath um, and, um, you know, she worked across disciplines. The same with um, uh, Lord Michael Young in the middle, as well as uh, establishing the Consumers Association, which he was also founder of the Open University, as well as another, a number of uh, other initiatives. And this is uh, Terence Conran um, at the end there. And Terence Conran, uh, as well as being a wonderful designer, he had to uh, invent his own route to market, which was the Habitat stores, because he couldn't get retailers to take his innovative designs. Um, you know, uh, changes and innovations that can take place that do have a transformational effect are examples like uh, you, see, uh, you see there. So this is um, a housing development that took place in Bordesley in West Birmingham, run by the Accord Housing Association. And they dealt with two issues. They dealt with unemployment, because they've taken uh, 11 unemployed uh, men, sorry, and they've given them, they've given them uh, housing through self-build. So they actually trained them to build those houses, and they're now living in them. Um, the next example is a very good example of um, uh, a disruptive approach to dealing with the problem of dementia, which was to provide housing for people in a very safe environment that is at the same time stimulating. So these are elderly people um, that's on the top left is a um, place called Hogerwick just outside Amsterdam. And on the bottom right is, um, is uh, Withenshaw just outside Bristol. And these are um, dementia villages with a very holistic approach to looking after people that gives them both the freedom to interact freely in a sort of a, a non-care environment, but at the same time, uh, it is a safe environment and they don't, don't have their needs met. And then finally, um, this is an example of a very good um, uh, work, uh, workspace development down in Hastings, uh, which has been run by 
Uh, so this is an organization wall, sorry. White Rock uh, Neighborhood Ventures, uh, led by Jess Steele, who some of you might know through an organization called uh, Locality. And what they've, established, what they've been able to do is acquire um, uh, property through a development trust. And they now know that, that no one can throw them out. And as Jess Steele has said, um, the way to take action, you know, if you're serious about uh, community-based development, is to buy property to take it off the market which they've done success, very successfully down there in, um, down in Hastings through the vehicle of a development trust. So to sum up, change is definitely required now as perhaps never before. Uh, we need transformational people and we need uh, transformational policies and we need to remove the barriers to change um, that uh, individuals have experienced from the, from the, from the bottom up, but also Barriers that governments face to change because they haven't got cooperative structures. So we need those channels for people to work together so that you do have overarching decision making. So you can make changes on things like climate change and you can mitigate the effects of technological unemployment, etc. And we need to operate on the small as well as the large scale, which is why like, people like you and me, we have a role uh, to play in this. And I always think we should, we should wish, <laughs> we should wish ourselves good luck in overcoming fear and uh, you know, adopting the strategies to be, to be the best we can be. Thank you very much.